Hi there, everyone. Thanks for joining in with me again this week. Well, we have made it up to the letter M, and there were a lot of choices this week. Um, there was Moses, there was Matthew, there was Malachi, there was all kinds of different M's, but I chose uh, to do two M's, as a matter of fact. Today, I think I'd like us to take a look at together the life of Mary and Martha that we find in the New Testament. It's a familiar story to us, but I think if we look at it together, we just might, we might discover some things that maybe we didn't know or think of some things that we hadn't thought of before. So this is the story of Mary and Martha that we find in the New Testament. Now, you know, when Jesus traveled around for the three years of his ministry, he traveled with a group of at least 12 disciples, maybe more at times. And there were some women that traveled along with Jesus that helped with um, preparing food while they were out and uh, taking care of the needs of the group. So when they came to uh, stay at someone's house, it was a large group of people. It wasn't just any small thing. So the story picks up today in the book of Luke, chapter 10. We see that Jesus and his disciples were on their way, and they came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now we know that this, is, this town is called Bethany. So Martha opens her home in hospitality to Jesus and his group. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. So preparations had already been made for Jesus to come, and Martha is in the thick of preparing things. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So she came to him and she asked, Lord, why don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Did you hear that? She says to Jesus, don't you care? Uh, pretty presumptuous of her, to assume that Jesus is not able to take in all the nuances of everything that's happening in the household. Don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? So at first we think that Mary isn't a helper at all, but when you read this carefully, you see that Mary has left her sister. So she was helping apparently at the beginning, but once Jesus arrived, she chose to sit and listen to Jesus. Tell her to help me, Martha says. So we see her as she's out there preparing the food, and I can so picture myself doing this. I have had company at my house many times uh, and thought to myself, I'm out in the kitchen and I'm uh, stirring and, and making all this food and grabbing all these dishes and, and doing all this stuff, and my company is sitting around talking, and am I enjoying them? No, I'm out in the kitchen, rushing around frantically, and even when someone would say, can I help you? No, 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 I'll, did it. I'll get it, I'll get it. And that's Martha, that was me being Martha to a T. So she goes to Jesus and tries to enlist Jesus to help her yell at her sister. But Jesus says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it won't be taken away from her. So what Jesus is saying, Mary, don't worry about whether the mashed potatoes are lumpy, or whether there's not enough gravy, or the pie crust isn't brown enough. Your sister Mary has decided to listen to me talk, has, has decided to sit with me and listen, and in this case, that's the better thing to do. He's saying to her, you are upset and worried about many things, but few are needed. And when you think about this after the fact, I, I have today when I was running through this before we started, and I thought she had the Lord of the universe in her home. And yet I can picture her being much like me out in the kitchen, fretting over trying to get the meal on the table. And she had the Lord of the universe that she could have asked any question or heard him speak. I wonder if she thought about that later on in her life. Because it was a God moment that she was missing. You know what a God moment is? It's one of those, those snapshot pictures in time when something important is happening that you capture. It can be, it can be something as simple as seeing a bird land near you. It can be something like the first time you ever hold your grandchild. 
It can be a moment of laughter and hugging. It could be a moment of insight when all of a sudden you realize, wow, I never thought about that. These are God moments. And what Jesus is saying to Martha is, you're going to miss the God moment because you're worried so much about things that don't matter in the scheme of things. And for all eternity, it won't matter, Martha, whether the meal is perfect or not. So the second time that we see Mary and Martha, we pick up in the book of John. John records for us now the story of Lazarus. Now a man named Lazarus was sick and he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It's, her, it's their brother. Uh, Lazarus was friends. They, Mary and Martha and Lazarus were friends with Jesus. Lazarus becomes sick. So now this, the Bible inserts in verse 2 that this Mary that we're talking about that was I just gave you in that story is the same Mary who, would, who poured perfume on Jesus and wiped her feet, wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to Jesus and said, Lord, the one you love is sick. So Jesus is not with them at this point when Lazarus gets sick. Remember, he traveled around, so he could have been anywhere. Now, we know from the scripture that he was in Jordan, which was about 18 miles away from Mary and Martha's house in Bethany. So her messengers that she's sending to Jesus, they have to go out and search for him. It's not like they can pick up the cell phone or send him a text and say, hey, hurry up and come home. They, he, they have to go find him. So she dispatches a messenger to go and try to find Jesus and tell him that Lazarus is sick. So when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory that, the son, that God's son may be glorified through it. So Jesus realizes that this situation now is a unique opportunity to cause others to have, let's say, cause others to have an opportunity to believe in him. So he, he's taking this in ahead of time. He says, no, this is not going to, this is not going to result in Lazarus death. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. It's not a case of him not caring that Lazarus is sick because he absolutely does. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And we may say, well, why, Jesus? Why would you do that? You knew that they needed you. Why would you be so mean and tarry when you could have stopped this bad thing from happening? But Jesus knows things we don't yet know in this narrative. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. So he had been in, in around the Jordan River area uh, when he was found, which was about 18 miles away, which would take them about a day or so to get there. So the messenger took a day to find him. He had finished up what he was doing there for two days. It took him another day to get back to Mary and Martha. So the disciples said to him, but Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going to go back? This is dangerous, and they didn't want Jesus to go. But Jesus answered, and he said, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daylight will not stumble, for they see by the world's light. If when a person walks at night, they stumble, for they have no light. Now, I'm not exactly sure what this means it but it does seem to me to be that Jesus is saying that um, there are 12 hours of daylight meaning there's still a space of time while I'm in the world where there's light which holds darkness at bay and if we walk in that light there would be safety we wouldn't stumble um, so I, I, I'm guessing and again if anyone has a better explanation of that that would be awesome, but I, I couldn't think of any myself. So after he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to go there and wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. So Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. When he said he's been sleeping, they thought he was just asleep, that he was sick. And they thought, well, that's a good thing. So then he told them plainly, no, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. 
but let us go to him. Notice Jesus says, this whole tarrying is being done for your sake. I'm not there, not because I'm tardy or not because I'm late. I'm not there because this is going to be to your benefit when you see what's going to happen. Then Thomas, it's one of the apostles, also named Didymus, that's Thomas who was the doubter, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Well, what he's talking about is back to the sentence about it being dangerous to go near Jerusalem, that the Jews were trying to plotting and trying to kill Jesus. So Thomas feels that there's real danger of Jesus being killed, but he said, let's go with him and we'll die with him. On his arrival in Bethany, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So when Mary and Martha had dispatched the messenger, Lazarus was near death. So the Jews always buried their dead within 24 hours of their death. So it would be, it stands to reason then that he has already died, he's been buried, and he's been in the tomb for four days when Jesus arrives. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. These same Jews who had come from Jerusalem might be part of the mob that yells, crucify Jesus, a week later. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Martha of the two sisters is the more active type. She takes things into her own hands and she goes out to meet Jesus who is on his way. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Well, at first it sounds like she's laying a guilt trip on Jesus. Jesus, it's your fault. If you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. But I'm not so sure that that's what she means. It seems to be when you read it again, Lord, she said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She meant, I trust you, Jesus. I believe in you. If you were here, Lazarus would never have died. You would have done something. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. She has great faith. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. So Martha answered, in, in the way of all of those that believed at that time, they believed in the resurrection. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She thought Jesus meant at the end of the age, when the day of resurrection comes, your brother will rise then, like everyone that I'm going to raise. Jesus said to her, this profound statement of deity that we find in John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Martha, all the power that is necessary to raise your brother is in me. I am the resurrection and the life. You don't have to wait. She had not yet seen this. She didn't know what was going to happen when Jesus himself was raised from the dead. She didn't know the resurrection power that Jesus had inside of him that he was about ready to show her. Jesus goes on to say, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe, she makes a statement of faith. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. Now, the King James Version says that she did this secretly. And I believe that it's done secretly because of the, the threat from these Jews who were looking for a reason to kill Jesus. Mary and Martha's conversation was secret. So she wanted her to know that Jesus was here and that he was asking for her. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. He's still outside of the village. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, 
She fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She said exactly the same thing that Martha said to the, to the letter. She said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Now this, this thing that he is about ready to do with Lazarus is a momentous moment in the New, in the New Testament. This is a, a time when Jesus is going to exhibit this great resurrection power. This is not something that he would have done casually. This would have been something that required the strength of the Godhead to cause this to happen. So he's troubled in his spirit. He's thinking about how this is going to happen and what he is going to do. This is not a time for frivolous thinking. He's troubled in his spirit. He comforted Mary and, and wept with her because he, he, he knew how grieving, how much grieving they were doing, how desperately they loved their brother and how they wished that he had been there. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then the shortest verse in the whole Bible is Jesus wept. Jesus cried over this. Tears ran down his cheeks over this. He knew that this is a solemn moment. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. So they interpreted Jesus crying as grieving of his own for Lazarus. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So see, this is a test of Jesus' ability. They, they're thinking to him themselves, if Jesus was able to make blind people see and all this, what what wouldn't he have been able to keep Lazarus from dying, even from a long distance if he chose to? So his his Jesus's behavior is now on display as a test, a test of faith and a test of this resurrection power. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. So she doesn't want the tomb un unsealed because of the natural things that would have happened to the body in four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Now, I'm sure Jesus had prayed to God the Father before he arrived at this moment at the tomb. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. This whole thing that's going to happen with Lazarus is for the purpose of, of allowing the people that see it happen to have greater belief in Jesus. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So Lazarus hears the voice of Jesus and comes forth from the grave. Much like the Bible says we will do, at the moment of the rapture, when the Bible says the dead in Christ will hear the voice of God and will be raised from the grave. So he, he does this miraculous thing by bringing Lazarus back to life and Lazarus emerges from the tomb and they unwrap all the grave clothes. Therefore, many of the Jews that had come to visit Mary had, and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. Many of the Jews that had not yet believed now believed when they saw that, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the third time we see Martha and Mary is six days before the Passover. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And here a dinner was prepared for Jesus. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Now, also in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
Sometimes they tell the same story, but in each gospel, every once in a while, there's a different fact. It's like if they were eyewitnesses to something that happened, the same thing would happen with us if we're called upon to be an eyewitness to an event. I might think of something that you didn't think of, or I might add a detail that you didn't add. Well, in this case, Matthew adds the detail and says that this was the house of Simon the leper. So we're not told who this Simon the leper is. Maybe Simon the leper was uh, another person that lived in Bethany and maybe was hosting this dinner and Mary and Martha were coming to help serve the food there. Or maybe this was their house and maybe Simon the leper might have been their father and they're still living in Simon the leper's house. We're not told, but we're told that a dinner is taking place and that Martha again is serving food. Um, in Mark, who records the same story, Mark says, and as he, Jesus, reclined at the table, which is how they ate their meals, laying down, reclining at the table, which was on the floor or near the floor, a woman came having an alabaster flask of ointment a very costly, pure nard, and she broke the alabaster flask and poured it over his head. So a woman arrives there, pours this expensive perfume on Jesus' head. In John, he says, then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So I, I believe it's Mary doing both things, although Mark reported that she poured this, this uh, alabaster flask on Jesus' head, and John reports that she also poured it on his feet. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, and she wiped his feet with her hair. Now, nard is also called spike nard, and it's an amber-colored essential oil with a strong musky fragrance, similar to valerian root. It was very costly, and it showed, by Mary doing this, it showed Mary's choice to give Jesus her very best offering. This was expensive perfume, and she did this for Jesus, a very expensive offering, a very heartfelt, loving offering. So she pours this oil on his feet and wipes his feet with her hair tender moment, a God moment that Mary entered into with Jesus. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. So that tells you how expensive this was. It was worth a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used it to help himself to what was put in it. So Judas Iscariot is the one that, that kept the purse of money for the disciples. So he figures she should have sold this and given, given me, Judas, she should have given us all of this money and then I could have had some of it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Truly, I tell you, whenever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told and be a memorial to her. So what she did was something precious that Jesus recognized. And he said, whenever this story is told, it will be told as a memorial to her for what she did. So Mary may have felt led to do this reverent act without even realizing that what was to take place a few days later in Jerusalem with the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. Whatever moved her, the Holy Spirit, or whatever was done, whatever she felt or had intuition to do, she did this in preparation without knowing it of what was about ready to happen. The disciples didn't understand even when he told them plainly that he was gonna die and would rise again on the third day. By this point, things were becoming very dangerous for both Jesus and his followers. 
So John chapter 12, verse 9 says just a little bit more of what happened after this event. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. I'm sure that Lazarus was a spectacle at this point. Look at the man that Jesus brought back to life. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. So they wanted to get rid of Lazarus because Lazarus was living proof in the resurrection power of Jesus. So what can we learn today that we didn't know before from these two women? So there's a couple of things. Number one, I thought to myself, it's unwise to judge others. Their walk with the Lord may be different from ours. What appears on the surface may not be the case at all. Was Martha unspiritual due to her constant fretting over serving? And was Mary lazy by not doing her share of the work and more concerned with her inner thoughts? When we first read this story, we assume automatically that Martha is not concerned with Jesus at all. And Mary isn't concerned with the preparing of the food or the hospitality at all. I don't think that's the case. I think that Martha also was spiritually minded and also listened to Jesus and also learned from Jesus. But at that moment that the Bible describes that particular dinner, she was distracted from that fact. Mary, on the other hand, had already been helping and of course was probably involved in all the hospitality that needed to happen. Of course, she probably wasn't lazy, but when she was faced or when she was able to grasp that God moment of being able to sit and listen to Jesus, to her that was so much more absorbing and so much more important that she left the tasks to go and spent her time and attention on Jesus. Now we should not we shouldn't judge each other where we're, all of us are not. I often say, oh, I'm a Martha, but there's times when I'm a Mary. There's other people that are a Martha and a Mary and a Mary and a Martha. We're all, we're all these things. We have to do these things together. We have to do the work and we also have to do, we have to do these things in balance. And that's what we're talking about today. Balance in our Christian walk right? This is what was out of balance for Martha at that moment. Not every day, not all the time. At that moment that this was captured, Martha's um, demeanor, Martha's, um, um, let's see, I can't think of the word I'm trying to think of. Martha's position she placed herself in was out of balance. Here was the creator of the universe, like I said, sitting in her living room, and she lost the concentration of that, instead was lured away by the hustle and bustle of the preparations that had to happen. And I've often found in my life, and I'm sure you have it too, that when I was working, it was, it was hard. I had a full-time career. I had a house to take care of. I had family members to care for. I had a mother. I had a sister. I had, I had friends and, you know, different events going on in Christmas and stuff. I was busy. And what I found was I had a hard time balancing my work career, my home life, and taking care of myself physically. Uh, when I had a lot to do, when we worked a lot of overtime, I never got to exercise. I wasn't taking care of myself physically. My spiritual life faltered at times. I didn't, I, I didn't have time to read my Bible. I wasn't praying. All this got out of balance. And what I found is I could usually keep two or three of these balls juggling in the air. But when it came trying to keep all of them juggling in the air, I've often failed, like Martha probably failed that day. So should we be both Martha and Mary? Life is certainly about balance. We have to go through life. We have to learn how to maintain this as we go through our Christian life. We need to spend time feeding our souls with God's word and spend time in prayer. If we neglect this part of our life and say we're a Martha all the time, we're not, we're suffering, our soul is suffering because we need that time alone with God. We need, if we could just sit with Jesus for real, wouldn't it be just awesome? Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing 
to ask him a question and have him answer. At the same time that we do this, if we're too much the other way, then we are not doing what the Bible says for us to do either, because we're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus, always working and preparing to do good to as many as we can, as often as we can. We can't just sit and do nothing. We have to do those things that are considered the good works that God has prepared us to do. So it is a balancing act. Just remember though, don't worry, God is never blind to your tears, never deaf to your prayers, and never silent to your pains. He sees it all, he hears it all, and he will deliver you. So even though we, we cringe when we read this thing that happened with Martha, we have to remember that Jesus loved Mary and Martha, and it wasn't a case of him chastising her that day. He wasn't blaming her. What he was saying to her in sympathy was, oh, Martha, you're worried about something that doesn't really matter at this time. So that's how it is with us. I think God does forgive us. There's times when we are distracted and we're not doing what we should be doing. But I know that God understands and he, he forgives us. So keep that in mind this week while you, um, while you ponder this story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And I'm sure you can see yourself in these two women. And even you men, I know that if you're watching, this isn't just about women's work. I'm sure if Jesus were coming to your house and going to be out in the yard, you would be cutting the grass and trimming the bushes and using the weed whacker and all that to make everything just so. And then when the company come, you would have, would you have time to sit at Jesus' feet? So it, this is a lesson for all of us. So until next week, I hope that you'll think about this story a little bit and pray on it and uh, accept the forgiveness that God has for when we are uh, fall down and we don't uh, live up to the to the ideal of the balanced Christian life that we should have. Okay, so let's bow in a moment of prayer together. Oh Lord, we do thank you so much for these Old Testament and New Testament stories because it's through these stories, Lord, that we learn who you are and what you are and we learn of, of your great love for us and your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive us for the times that we are less than ideal. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, folks, next week we come to the letter N. So we'll see what we have in store for you then. Thanks so much and have a blessed week.